Okay. Should I start? All right. Uh, it's great to be here uh, in these weird times and to actually be here in person. Uh, this is my outline for today. I'll try to briefly overview my research interests. Then I'll cover a few preliminaries. Some of them will be maybe trivial, but it's important that we we'll all be on the same page. And there'll be two main parts for the talk, one more in genetics and the other part is related to the more biological work that I'm doing. And then I'll talk about future work and conclude. So I work in computational biology, it's very interdisciplinary fields and most people in the field have my more computational interests and my more uh, biological interests. On the biology side, I'm interested in the molecular biology of exercise in uh, physical fitness. I guess we tend to take for granted the fact that exercise is good for you. It's thanks to thousands of years of human experience, even in ancient times, we have documentation of uh, physicians prescribing exercise at different capacities. And up to more modern research about how exercise can prevent diseases, including different types of cancer, um, how it improves mental health, and we can even quantify to some extent the financial burden of inactivity and so on. However, there is, a, there is a huge knowledge gap. We don't really understand at the molecular level the changes that occur after exercise, after a training program. Um, we don't know how to explain heterogeneity between individuals. For example, a recent uh, study called Heritage showed that um, roughly 20% of individuals did not respond at all to a certain type of endurance exercise. So when most people improve their heart, their cardiovascular uh, capabilities, around 20% don't at all. And we don't really know why is that. And uh, this field has been lagging behind other fields in, in biology in terms of data science and data sets that are available. But over the last five years, probably the next decade or so, uh, there will be many exciting uh, data sets that are going to come out. The clinical goals would be the first goal is very ambitious. We want to learn how to mimic the beneficial effects of exercise by interventions, for example, for people with different diseases that do not do any training. Um, but the more immediate goal would be to improve, to, to learn how to optimize and personalize, um, especially given the uh, condition that people have. Uh, this is an example from a review. There is even new terminology that comes out of the field. Uh, for example, exerkines is a term that is used to describe uh, new molecules that we identify the change uh, during training adaptation. On the computational side, as many people in computational biology and um, using tools in machine learning, bioinformatics pipelines, but above all these days in causal inference, we can think of this as a, a general field where we try to look at data and try to understand whether there is a causal connection between variables and can we even quantify that causal connection? So a computer sees, for example, a data set that we just collect about this toy example, the weather, ice cream consumption, and sunburn, but it doesn't know that it is that the weather causes these two variables and it will just see correlation between all these three, right? And this field has been, it's an old field. You can even say it's as old as science itself. But over the last 30 to 40 years, there have been a lot of progress being made uh, in, in theory and algorithms. There are two main branches. First is from the statistical community called potential outcomes. In fact, that 2021 Nobel Award in Economics was given for people that were pioneers in the field. And in, in computer science, the focus is more on graphical models. These two are, are equivalent in many ways and complementary in others. Uh, but both are quite useful. And from my personal experience, the methods and tools that come out of these fields are, are a bit underexplored or underused in molecular biology. And one of my goals is to learn uh, which models are useful for our field, adapt, improve them, and develop practical methods. There are a few preliminaries. Some, some will probably be trivial, but just to make sure that we all use the same language for the rest of the talk. So this graph, this plot here tries to show us the standard way of how we acquire data in, in computational biology. You start with some uh, phenotype of interest, 
uh, or a disease. So in this case, it's an example from the obesity studies. Then you go and you decide which tissues or organs you want to measure or you want to compare between individuals. Um, and this could be measured in different cell types or in different time points. Then if you zoom into the actual cellular level, there are different types of mechanistic uh, functions within the cells that you may want to query. So the different types of features at the end of the day that you can quantify. Um, typically in this field, the different types of molecular features are called ohm or omics. So you will see in papers, we measure the multi-omic data set. It just means that you measure at least two different types of molecules in the data. And just to give you two examples, uh, genetic variants are uh, cases in genetics where we just measure if people have a certain mutation. So you can think of it as an almost binary way to partition people based on if they have a certain mutation in the genome versus people that don't have a mutation in the genome. Um, most of the other feature types are more continuous, such as in gene expression or in proteomics, where we measure uh, some proxy scores for the activity of a gene or a protein. Okay. Now we measure these features, let's say in different conditions, and now we could use statistical tests, for example, to uh, reject or, or not reject the given null hypothesis. There's one classic example. You measure a feature in different conditions. No, Almost the same mute. And in this example, we measure a, a blood pressure before and after some treatment. And then we can compute some sort of p value. And if it's low enough, yeah. we'll check the and think yeah. that there is a fact. Yeah. Uh, can, can we mute them? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Another type of tests are conditional independence tests, where we, for example, can ask if a variable A is independent of a variable B, given another set of variables C. This is useful, for example, in genetics, where we ask if a genetic variant, let's say, is independent of a disease, given the ethnicity of the individuals. And if, if that is the case, then we uh, are not likely to think that that genetic variant is actually uh, related to that disease. It's just the ethnicity. Uh, um, that drives that correlation. Now, if we measure this variable in many different studies or many different scenarios, so let's say we took that blood pressure and we have a bunch of studies that measured very similar biological questions. Now we may want to use ideas from meta-analysis. So this is a standard plot where each row represents a result from a study. So you have a point estimate and, and the variance around it. Um, these are examples from a, a response for a given a drug, and this is the odds ratio. And then in meta-analysis, we may be interested in some average over the studies, but we may also be interested in quantifying the excessive variability. So how different the study are, is there a biological reason that, there's, that they're different? So imagine just for the sake of the argument that these studies measured individuals with a different age groups, and maybe the effect of the drug depends on the age group. And if that is the case, we will use ideas from uh, meta regression. So we will just use a slightly more involved uh, model where we will say that the actual effect that I of the study I depends on some other covariates uh, that we know and measure, and we know that they affect that biological question. So then this is an example for a model without conditioning on that covariate versus a model that does use that covariate. Uh, and you can see that the dash time represents the residual and the age just shrink based on adding that covariate. And in this case, we'll say that this model has a, has a better fit and we can use standard tests to decide between the two. Okay, now we'll move to the main first part. I'm gonna use these meta-analysis and these statistical tests over and over again. And now in, in causal graphical models, we use graph described, directed graphs to describe causal interactions between variables. That means that we, claim actually that the value, for example, this variable E, we need to close the, uh, are determined functionally mechanistically by U and G. Uh, of course, this graph is a nice way to describe, um, to describe our, our, our data set, but this is definitely not enough. So we'll have to add what we call a parameterization of the graph. We need to describe the noise terms of the variables and we need to describe the actual functional form in which the variables get their values. And this is a 
a very simple linear example where we can write down the actual structural equation. So we can write down that E, for example, is, is actually being determined by G and U plus noise. And then we can play with the models. Let's say we can describe O as a function of U and G in this example. Now I put this graph here both because it's a very simple per example, but also this graph in a way represents what we do in, in randomized trials where G could denote the actual randomization and E would be an exposure of interest. So let's say, uh, yeah. On the variable uh, that number? Sorry? How should they think? So usually I think that each node contains a vector in three dimension. You in this specific that? example, it's just one dimensional, dimensional one. one. Yes, it's a very simple example. So as I said, uh, G would be a randomization. E would be, uh, we usually call it the exposure or, or the risk factor. So you can think of E as, let's say, LDL cholesterol. O would be an outcome of interest, like a disease. So let's say it's our disease. And we try to measure the causal effect from E uh, to O. So what is the effect of LDL on heart disease? And you are usually observed or unobserved confounders. Okay? Yes. Is it always such a simple algebra or just for the sake of the... It's just for this example. Yeah. It doesn't have to be this way. What makes this uh, causal? Uh, you could reverse the uh, edges and then get the uh, reverse direction. That's true. Well, I'll talk about uh, why is it causal in, in two slides, all right? And what does it actually mean? Okay. Uh, but that heavily relies on the, obviously on the assumptions uh, of the graph. So um, this is what the process actually is in a randomized trial here on the left. You have these uh, randomization process. Some people, let's say, get treatment A, some get treatment B. The act of actually randomizing physically uh, breaks connections with confessional confounders. And then we can measure the effects of this specific drug. There are some cases in nature, in a way, as if nature did the experiment for us. And this is called a Mendelian randomization uh, process. So we have a genetic variant. And it partitions the populations into, let's say, two. And technically, it could be also three. Let's say it's two. Some people with the genetic variant, in our example, let's say they have more bad cholesterol in their blood versus people that don't have that mutation and they have less uh, cholesterol in their blood. And then the process is very similar to what we do in practice in trials. It's as if nature now changed this exposure, this risk factor, and now we can compare these two groups and get causal estimates. And now we live in times where we have huge genetic databases like the UK Biobank that gives us information about the, gen the genetics of hundreds of thousands of individuals and their disease states. And we could use that for this type of analysis. How does it work in, in practice? This is one simple way to uh, address that linear uh, model. So in practice, we're not gonna observe or we can only partially observe potential confounders. We want to come up with a way to actually quantify these beta here uh, using this model. Okay, so we're making very strong assumptions that we know that this G, which we will call it the instrumental variable, is external. It's not linked to O. And we uh, now could quantify this specific correlation, sorry, the specific causal effect from E to O. And the way to do this is actually quite simple. You use uh, standard linear regression method. So you can regress O versus G, get the coefficient uh, for this regression. You do the same for E versus G. And this causal effect will just be the ratio of the two, okay? So if you don't have the genetics and you don't know the observed confounders, you can take the data, you can compute correlations, but this gives you a way to actually try and infer what this beta actually means. Now one uh, huge benefit of this uh, entire model is that these, um, results for the outcome, the disease versus the genetics, and the exposure versus of the genetics could come from two different databases. So all that you need to do is to sum, is to share these summary statistics between these two databases, and you don't really need to uh, actually share genetic information that may be uh, problematic to share. And when you have these data from two different samples, it's called a two-sample Mendelian randomization. Sorry, this is for the Gaussian, Gaussian model? Only? This is a simple Gaussian model, yes. 
that this property is only holds for the discussion on the map. When it's not, there are different ways and methods to try and quantify. Like if the data is discrete, we have ways to do that. And there are also ways to try and account for uh, trigenity. So that will be deviations from the model. So for this sake of argument, we'll, we'll use this simple model for the rest of the talk. So does, does the aspect of the formalistic assumption or the independence assumptions and the as aspect of the computational methods? The critical thing is the independence assumption. Yes, then, well, then we'll deal with the estimation for this. Yes, model. we're going to describe this in more detail. But yes, essentially you're right. Now, in practice, you're going to have typically more than different genetic variants, different genes that are could affect, for example, LDL cholesterol. And now when we can get a causal estimate from each of these genetic variants, so this is what these graphs try to show. This is an example from a natural data set that examined LDL cholesterol versus heart, di heart disease. And you can see that each different genetic variant could give you a different estimate. And we we'll use ideas from uh, meta-analysis to get some average estimate. And we may also be interested in uh, uh, quantifying the heterogeneity, so uh, how different the genetics uh, uh, are. So it could be that one gene thinks that the effect is X, and another gene thinks the effect is <coughs> different from X. And we want to quantify that. Um, because it's important if we see that there is an excessive variability here, we may not trust our, our own assumptions, and then we will need maybe to explore other models. And over the last five years or so, there have been an explosion of methods that basically try to take this plot and, and try to quantify the causal effects given different assumptions. But the, essentially, the simple approach is to apply some, some uh, weighted average. Uh, and we use these techniques in, in a variety of, of papers where we set with experts and decided which type of genetics we need to use and whether the causal estimate makes sense. There's just a few examples. Uh, the first paper here at the top shows a, a causal effect from hand grip strength to heart disease, so coronary artery disease. Hand grip strength is just a very crude score for physical activity in individuals. And even with all the noise that it has, it still has uh, some utility in it. The second example here is from the AGI consortium where basically most centers showed uh, using genetic data, a causal effect from BMI to COVID hospitalization. Not a big surprise, we pretty much knew that, but it's nice to see that across different populations, different genetics, different techniques, you get the same result. Uh, the, last example, the last example here is a, a causal estimation from uh, a disease called restless leg syndrome into quality of sleep. So the actual connection was not that important, but the people in the field were, uh, uh, found the actual causal effect pretty useful. Um, yeah. Causal hardcore? The, here? Yeah, I meant that the meta-analysis is done from the diagram, from the data of the students in the bibliotheque. Is it better if it was the data from the other side? Is there a chance that it was the data from the other side? We'll talk about this in a second. It could be more useful both for the functional form and both for testing our own hypothesis. Yes. Um, here is another example. We used a, this is a larger scale uh, example. We took 35 different blood biomarkers or urine biomarkers. So it's a standard test that people could do. And from that UK Biobank database, and uh, we use uh, uh, the actual genetics from other data sets. So these are independent studies that, for example, tested heart disease and so on. And then while analyzing all these things together, we came up with this summary graph that shows many expected results, such as basically bad cholesterol to heart disease. But it was also interesting to see effects into different, uh, into some cancers, such as prostate cancer. It was also interesting to actually compare different biomarkers. It does seem that different types of biomarkers may be more important than others. So it's not only the fact that you can quantify whether you think that there is a causal effect or not, it's the fact that you could also in some cases actually estimate the causal effects and, um, and use them and compare them to results from trials. Now, one thing that we saw under the rug so far and uh, is very problematic are the assumptions of this entire thing, all right? So we were assuming that we have different genetic variants in the literature, you can, they're often called SNPs. We assume that they all are linked to this exposure that we could measure. But more importantly, we're assuming that all these SNPs are connected to the outcome only through that exposure, right? So we were assuming that it could be that the SNP is connected to some unobserved confounder, 
and then that affects the outcome. Because if this is the case, then this analysis that I was describing is biased. It won't give you the actual causal effects. All right. Moreover, if you only have an exposure and an outcome in your data set, then you cannot justify this entire this assumption that you made here graphically just from the data. Okay, this runs into identification issues and practically you can't do that. All right, however, in this uh, paper that we published this year or 2021, pretty recently, we show that if you have access to the sample level data and you're willing to analyze many phenotypes together, then, and we're making some statistical assumptions along the way, then you could test the, the actual assumptions and come up with some guarantees for the analysis. So in a way, we have now a bigger data set. We do a lot of these pairwise analysis. And we want to get some guarantees along the way. Um, and the way it works, we presented three different algorithms. The first two here are ways in which you can define or identify if a, if a genetic variant, which we'll call an instrument, is a valid instrument for the analysis uh, between X and Y, or maybe it's not a valid. So again, again, what, what is a valid instrument? So a valid would mean that these assumptions hold. There is, it's not likely that you have a causal path, let's say, to the confounder and then to the outcome directly. All right? And then the last example would be a non-Mendelian randomization test for the null hypothesis that there is no causal path, let's say, from one variable X to another variable. And uh, I'll try to give you just the, the, an overview or the intuition of how this algorithm one and three work, okay? Um, so to get into that, we need to use some uh, uh, ideas from graphical models. First, we have uh, the notion of this separation is, you can think of this as a, just as a very simple way to define whether an odd X and uh, an odd Y are uh, connected or not in a directed graph, given another set of nodes in the graph, okay? So in this example, X and Y are uh, de-separated given the marginal set. It's crucial that we have these, or well, the most important thing are not just the, the actual directed pathways, but also these, uh, what are called colliders. They basically separate X and Y. Uh, and if you condition on them, they could create some uh, connection. But this anyway is just a graphical definition uh, in graph theory. Now, what is a very uh, old and, uh, an interesting result is that if the underlying causal diagram that has generated the data is a directed acyclic graph, then this separation in the graph means conditional dependence <coughs> in the data. And that's a very uh, strong result because it means in any parameterization of this graph, okay, this will hold. And ever since there have been a few more theoretical results showing that this, uh, this uh, rule may be uh, useful in a few examples where you have cycles in the data. Um, but then these examples are more involved and usually you don't see even these separations. And, and again, parameterization of the graph means? Means, as we said before, if you add actually what is the noise that is associated with each variable and the actual functional connections between them, okay? Because you don't, you don't see that just from the graph. So that instantiation of this graph. In, in a way, sense. yeah. yeah. Um, now, the way uh, causal discovery algorithms work, so this is a, a full field in, in, in graphical models. So this idea of this separation entails statistical independence is called, often called the Markov property. Then the reverse direction is called the faithfulness assumption. So this would be the assumption that if there is an actual causal path from X to Y, then you will actually see statistical association in the data. If you have both, if you're willing to assume faithfulness, uh, then we have an if and only if connection between the two. And this is the basis for an entire field of algorithms uh, that are called causal discovery algorithms. And the way they work is typically as follows, very crude overview. Most of them assume that you have some oracle, some statistical oracle that knows just by magic if variables are associated or not. So in a way, these algorithms are very theoretical. They're assuming independence uh, uh, infinite sample size and power of one, basically, which is not very practical. So, the, uh, so we, for, for yes, something, I try to get something. But it's, it's yes. Also, so what? What? How do we really measure uh, the, the CI? The, the, the CI. So, for example, if you have a linear model, you can ask if two variables have a linear connection between them once you screen off or you condition on other variables. It's a very uh, 
Let me that's check that that's, that's by... By standard, there are standard linear regression methods that yes, you could use. Okay. And we need enough, enough independent samples, that's what we require? Yeah, so the way these methods work is essentially you, so we assume that we have this statistical black box that doesn't make mistakes, which is very problematic. And then they will first uh, infer what is called the skeleton graph. So it's a graph where you put an edge between two variables if they cannot be rendered independent. So you took these variables and over and over again, you condition on many other sets of variables and they are always statistically connected. Okay, so they always seem to be dependent. Now, once you have this skeleton graph, this is where the, diff the different algorithms vary quite substantially. In a way, they will take this graph, they will probably make more assumptions about the data and come <coughs> up with combinatorial way to orient the edges in the skeleton graph or one output could be, I don't know how to orient the specific edge. Um, what we will find is that um, we don't really need the, the, this part. This part is very problematic. In a way, these algorithms tend to be not very practical. Okay, first of all, it's not reasonable to assume that you have a statistical oracle in practice and their runtime is exponential. I don't understand statistical oracle. Statistical oracle is just meaning that you can get IAT samples for the model? No, it would mean that you could look at the data and now you ask if A and B are conditioned independent, let's say some C, that then you have an algorithm that tells you whether it's true or false. So there's no data really. So in the these algorithms, in a way, concept. yes, in the way this. Yes. Many algorithms just take the data, they build the model, orienting the edges. There is no ground proof to orienting the edges because at the end of the day, it's just a model for the distribution. So I can always give you a click, learn the probabilities over it, and it's universal, right? And the right. question is how many edges can you throw away? It's not well, it's not only that, it really depends on the assumptions that you're willing to make, right? But I will not make any assumptions if you don't make any assumptions whatsoever. Because it's right. more than a joint distribution. So I'm missing something. No, no. The, again, yes. Some the complexity bound here also. So you right. so, are impossible, but I'm not seeing why. No, you're right. If you're not making causal assumptions about the data, then you won't be able to orient anything. So what these models typically assume, and I was trying to not get into that too much here, is for example, you're assuming that there is no selection bias in the entire data set. And for example, many algorithms assume that selection bias is where uh, you essentially condition on a variable that is uh, a downstream of all these variables that you measure. So this is a very strong causal assumption. And often also these algorithms will assume that there is no one confounder effect that causes all these variables. And under these assumptions, there are situations where you can orient graphs. This is basically all of Judea Pearl's work uh, over the years. And, 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 and like you're saying, Rightfully so, if you're making no assumption, you just look at the data and everything is connected on the time, then you just have a click. And no, that's it. Previously. Yes. You want it. Yes. Faster, right. Um, okay, so what we will do is we'll just use these skeletons. All right, and we'll make that assumption that there is no uh, variable that is uh, caused by all everything that we measure, and then you just by chance condition on that variable. So that's no selection bias in the data. So the way this Seagage algorithm works, so first you have to have some uh, statistical heuristics, but we learn these uh, skeletons between the, the data sets that we have. So let's say we have a set of phenotypes or diseases that we take and we want to analyze them. So let's say 100 blood tests and different diseases. Now we have the genetic variants from that UK large UK biobank database. And we learned two skeletons. First, we uh, try to infer the skeleton graph. So which disease pairs or biomarker pairs are always associated, even when you condition on many other diseases and, and not too many because uh, we're limited in runtime, but when you condition on other reasonable diseases and so on. So in a way we're trying to quantify which variables are always connected, but we do that ignoring the genetics, that, that's important. Then we add the genetics into the mix and we ask which of the genetic variants are associated with these uh, 
with these phenotypes that we have, uh, but in a strong way. Again, conditioning on other diseases does not render that statistical association independent. Okay, so in the end, we get a bipartite graph between the genetics and the phenotypes and a skeleton graph among the phenotypes. Okay, now the idea of the first filter is that just from these skeletons, we can learn which are not likely to be reasonable genetic variants to use as input for that Mendelian randomization analysis. And the idea works something like this. So first of all, if we see the two phenotypes are not connected in our skeleton, then we know that there is no genetic uh, variable that is directly linked to these two. Because if this was the case, we were ignoring the genetics while we learned the skeleton, they should have been uh, remain connected, okay? Now to generalize this idea, what if X and Y are not connected in the skeleton, but they are separated by some set of variables S. Then we showed in this paper that actually all the genetic variants that are linked to that set S in our skeleton graph are necessarily not variables that you could use as input for the analysis. Um, with some changes of what is said, <clears throat> you need to have some properties for this set S, but it's not very important to understand this idea. So example, this algorithm will know, for example, if the data are generated from this graph, then S, if you condition an S, X and Y become independent in the data set, and all the genetic variants that are connected into S in, the, in our skeleton have to be removed. In practice, that removes about 20% of the genetic data from, from the analysis, but there are some cases where it removes about 90%. Uh, and some of them are quite, uh, in some cases, the effect is quite uh, strong. Um, the other test that we, or the other algorithms in this paper was based on this observation. If there is, if our null hypothesis is there is no directed causal path from X to Y, then under the assumptions that we make here, conditioning an X should not, quote unquote, eliminate statistical variants or uh, interactions between genetic variants and that uh, Y. So what this observation basically means is we can take our genetic variants from the data without any selection. We take all of them. We compute first the Z value for the association between G and Y. Typically you condition on some set of variables that you know are, are you, you always condition on like the population structure and age and sex, which is a common practice. But then we compute Z2, which will be the same association but we add that variable X. Okay, so under this uh, simple observation, we could reduce the entire thing to asking whether or not in this 2D plot of Z1 versus Z2, there is no set of nodes in this area in the graph. Yes? So, so I might have missed something in the second part, but if you have two, two different genes that affect your, uh, uh, your exposure, but only one of them uh, affects the outcome, so you, you will get this selection bias. So, this is something wonderful, right? If you have the selection bias, if you have selection so. bias in a specific set, you have two genetics, two genetics yes. that affect the exposure, right? But only one of them affects the outcome directly. So, that's right. my point. So, in this case, you will have this. Selection. If there is so a, what the, well, could under the null that there is no path from X to Y, that there won't be. I'm sorry? If, if under the null, uh, if you have a variant that is connected to both, then under the null, you will still not be in that area because it will still remain correlated. But you um, will yeah. have correlation through, so between the gene and the outcome, you'll have, uh, you'll have correlation through the-, the Right, but not, but condition on X, it will be the same. It will still be significant. We can take it offline and draw it. Um, all right, and then um, without going into too much detail, we're asking whether or not, our null hypothesis is there is no, basically points in this area of the QD plot. And we came out with uh, a likelihood ratio test to, to measure that. Uh, and I won't go into too much details of that. I'll just show you a few examples from results. Let's start with a few simulations. So it's not very common in the field if you just read the papers to simulate big data sets. So simulating a graph with 15 data sets with cycles is considered pretty, pretty big. What, what does it mean to simulate? So, so in this, we're gonna simulate data where we know the actual mechanistic connection between the variables and we're gonna create data sets from each graph. So you going... start with the data, you come up with a, with mm -hmm. a, a graph and then you reproduce no, the data. you start with the graph, yeah. you, you add characterization, 
the graph you generate. You generate the graph or someone else generates. No, I will generate the graph. Yes. That's the ground truth. Yeah. Now I'm going to generate data from that graph. According to the graph. Yes. And I'm going to run these different algorithms with or without our filters. And I'm going to measure, for example, a false discovery would be an algorithm thinks that there is a connection. Uh, we will get the same graph or according to the graph. Right? Yes, or at the very least, if an algorithm thinks that there is a path from X to Y, and we know the reason, then that will be a false discovery. It's a very simple test. In a way. And uh, a generic graph in which, like a, 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 a benchmark for which you should, your method should work, or you come up with your graph? For we just situation. simulate them. Uh, yeah, this is just- But is your graph, or is that you have like benchmarks? Of graphs? We don't have benchmarks. There is no strong benchmark that I'm aware of in this field. We, we just simulate data. On graph that uh, you come up and, with your- and yeah. Based, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So is there something special for, for the genetics that you're looking at? Or so you know, for example, yes, you, you, yeah, so in the biology, it's not, it was implied so far, but we know that, for example, those diseases that we work on, they don't change the DNA of an individual. So we know for sure there is no causal connection from, let's say, a disease, let's say a heart disease that changes your DNA. Which is not okay. So all these Mendelian randomization methods use a lot of biological information in a very strong way. Okay. Um, okay. So in this example here, uh, this is just one example. We we did a lot of simulations. We have a variable that basically determines how likely a, a genetic variant that we add to the graph would be different. Would, would not satisfy the the assumptions that this method make. Right. So the the larger this this uh, key player variable is then the more difficult it is for the, for the algorithms to actually find things. Um, our filters quite consistently reduce the empirical false discovery rate while retaining most of the actual uh, causal connections. One thing that was kind of surprising in, this, in doing these large-scale simulations is that methods that are, are used widely in the field, like MRAGR and Bayesian networks, um, um, have basically very high false discovery rates are they're practically useless. And each of these algorithms are cited at hundreds of times, if not a few thousands of times. Yes. So what does false discovery rate mean? It's like they are adding more errors than needed. A false discovery means that the algorithm thinks uh, yeah, that there is an edge and, and there's no edge. Right? No, not necessarily an edge. There is a causal path from X to Y, at least one. Okay. But from the graph, we know that there isn't. That's a false discovery rate in this context, okay? okay. And then our uh, non-Mendelian randomization test works well. So under the null, it does create a false discovery control, but we found that in practice, it tends to have low power. So it gives you a few results, but they tend to be okay uh, in terms of false discovery. Question? Yeah, sure. In this context, wouldn't you want to define your discoveries as, uh, or maybe you are, and I'm confused about the, uh, the terminology, yeah. you would want to describe your discoveries as, as potential instrumental variables, right? The ones that can serve as instrumental variables would be your discoveries. Well, that's another way to test our filters. That's, that's a very really good point. At the end of the day, in this specific paper, at least, we're not interested in identifying necessarily the genetic instruments. We may, maybe our filters are not perfect. Keep in mind that these MR methods also have some assumptions and models that they're used to try and clean the data further. Our whole point here is that by using these methods, we can reduce the actual empirical false discovery. And we don't necessarily know that all the genetics so that we find- directly actually. discovering causality. This is not uh, going through the instrumental variables. Yes, it's true that implied some of the genetic variables that we remove are not likely to actually be causal for disease. And it could be used for other analysis as well. That, that's a good point. Uh, and these are some results in, in the UK Bar Bank data. Uh, essentially, there are many expected results and many uh, and a few uh, new ones. Our filters, for example, we moved uh, a causal effect from coffee intake to height, which is kind of interesting. Uh, unfortunately, in this field, we don't have a good cold standard. So we don't have a graph where we know exactly that the biology is right and we can now quantify the different algorithms. There are anecdotal examples, and this is why. In all these papers, we work with specific experts, let's say from heart disease or from different situations so that they will scan the literature and try to give us uh, some idea of whether our results are useful. Uh, 
so since I want to, I don't really have time for the next part, but uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just go over the next part even quickly. Um, okay, so let's put cause and inference aside for a second. As I said, I have two types of research that I work on. Uh, the second part would be about the molecular uh, biology of exercise. So, well, I think it was great that you asked uh, questions. It was fun, but uh, I'll try just to give you a rough idea of what we do in the field. Okay, and and obviously this field is actually a bit less technical. So, in terms of the computational tools that we need, uh, at least these days. So, as I said, there is a huge knowledge gap in the field, um, and we try to close the gap. So we try to get some ideas of what actually changes in the body at the molecular level of the exercise. In my postdoc, I, I've taken three different approaches to try and narrow the gap. The first is a meta-analysis of basically all available gene expression studies. So all studies that actually measured many genes and their response before and after exercise. Um, so this is, on the left here is the data that we have now. And these two projects are the data that we uh, will have in the future. Or some of it are also actually starting to, to come out. So the first is through an, a large NIH project called Motopack, where we uh, designed and ran experiments that actually measure many different types of uh, tissues and molecules in response to exercise. And the last part, the last project is uh, measuring the genetics of people with extremely high endurance capabilities. So we measure or we collected over the years at Stanford around 700 Olympic uh, genetic data from around 700 uh, Olympic athletes. So usually marathon runners or uh, cross, key, cross country skiers. They tend to have the best parts in a way. They have the best cardiovascular system. Um, and then the idea would be to try and identify, do these people have anything uh, unique in their genetics? I could just tell you that so far, uh, um, we're still not there. It does seem that we're still underpowered. And there's a lot of work to do. I don't expect to see, uh, I expect to see preliminary results in a year or so for this project. So I'll not talk about this now. I will just try in a few minutes, quickly go over other analysis. So the first paper is, uh, 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 which is very standard in the meta-analysis field. You go to uh, some public databases that have all these data sets that people uh, uh, publish. Then you do some search, what is related to exercise in human and so on. We manually have to go over all of these and decide which data set are actually related to what we're trying to find and what not. We came out with uh, 43 different data sets um, that cover uh, 59 different cohorts. The reason that you may have more cohorts in data set is some data sets, for example, measure two types of exercise, resistance and endurance and so on. So they have different interventions. Uh, then we partition these data sets based on the tissue that they measured and whether or not they had the long-term training uh, program versus a single acute bowel of exercise, okay? Um, and then in each cohort, we can quantify uh, the change in each gene in the time point before the intervention and in one or more time points after the intervention. Okay, so we measure these four changes, these YIs and their variants, and this will be the input for uh, the meta-analysis that we run. And now we do this for each gene. We also try to ask if a gene, the response of a gene may depend on age, on sex, maybe on the training program. So there is some resistance, some are endurance and so on. Um, so just because we're out of time, I'll show you one example of result that we could find. These, we found around 200 genes, uh, a lot of which were not well characterized before, that could be clustered into four different types of response. You have early to mid response, early only, and two clusters of late response. So this is in muscle in the few hours after you do a single exercise uh, intervention. And uh, then we could take these cluster of genes and we could overlay them on a network of known physical interactions between the genes. What we find here is these core of genes that respond early are all well known to be associated with the response uh, to exercise in heart and muscle. And then there are many new candidates that are connected to these genes. And many of them would be used for subsequent, uh, subsequent experiments. Even in this paper alone, we validated uh, six out of eight potential candidates in a completely independent data set that our collaborators 
collector. Uh, and then I just want to say a few words on these small effect projects, and then we'll, we'll, we'll conclude. Um, this is a big NIH project. It's a 2017 flagship project, how they call it. We have more than $200 million to do these studies. And there are 25 different labs. Uh, I work at, center, at, uh, at Stanford at the Bioinformatics Center, where uh, together with uh, one other person, we're the lead data scientist in the project. We have our own teams that run all the bioinformatic pipelines and we design some of the studies here. Essentially what we try to do here is we have experiments in animals where we measure many tissues over a limited number of time points. And we have a, a experiments in human. Our goal is to reach 2000 individuals, each individual is going through a training program and we have measurements from blood, adipose and muscle uh, before and after the training program. So it took us three years to just design this entire thing and implement all the algorithms and the chemical analysis. And uh, we described this in this paper here, uh, how this is going to work. There are many ongoing projects these days, unfortunately due to COVID, the human studies got delayed in this year, but we do expect to see the first human small human study this year. So it's part of Omicron, we still seem to work reasonably well. And um, we do have results from, from analysis of, uh, of uh, animal experiments. This is an, an experiment in rats where we run an eight week training program and we sacrifice the rats at different time points. So the rats actually run on a treadmill and they improve their cardiovascular fitness over time. And now we, it sacrificed them in different time points. In each time point, we take the rat, we harvest many different tissues. And now each sample from a tissue is a sample that we could run on which we run up to 15 different experiments. So we get all these feature types over time and over space, which would be the different organs and tissue. And then just to give you an example of results, this is an, a summary, a graphical summary of the results in heart. Uh, the rows here con correspond to different states. So we have whether or not, let's say a gene or a protein that we measure went up or down or did not change in males versus females. So we have nine different states and we have four uh, uh, time points, which are the, the week one, two, four, and eight, which are the columns in this graph. And the most uh, conspicuous results, for example, in heart were consistent between the sexes and they were consistent between the feature types that we measured. So in a way, the heart remodeling is being affected in all feature types, everything in many different pathways that seem to jointly just change. And the heart both is changing structurally and it's also been, becomes much better in the way that it utilizes energy for functions. There are other tissues where the response is sex specific or is limited to only one type of molecule. That's very useful for, for understanding the biology of the process. Um, and then we can use different methods to dive into specific genes and using methods from uh, network biology in order to understand, okay, what are the specific genes that are likely to drive these processes that we observe? And this would be interesting candidates for experiments. And here you have a few computational uh, questions that are interesting. So just to summarize this part and, uh, and maybe you have some time for a few questions. We do, um, I presented a meta-analysis of basically all available studies in the field, but now through MotorPack and that genetic consortium, uh, uh, I have the privilege of working with the data sets of the future that will drive new discoveries in the fields in the next uh, 10 years or so. Um, I did add a few slides for what I think are exciting future work. Um, I can talk about this more offline, but as you could imagine, I'm working in this trade-off between computational biology using statistical methods to answer questions in, in biology. But what I think is also quite interesting and sometimes less appreciated is that using these biological assumptions and using everything that we, we know in this field of causal inference is actually crucial for us to come with practical algorithms and ask ourselves whether or not computers could actually learn these causal effects or just, as was mentioned here before, just assume that everything is a click and, and it's useless. So I'll leave you with this <laughs> philosophical uh, pondering and I have to thank many different people. I have two uh, PIs at Stanford. Many Rivas is more uh, statistics computational. Uh, you and Ashley is my main advisor from the cardiovascular school and I have many different collaborators in this uh, large multi project. Uh, thank you. <laughs>
person. So far, so. What? Uh, about 50 questions so far. So. Oh, yeah, there were some questions. <laughs> what? It's not a question, but it's not a question. The question is the question of the question ויורנס אטליץ, לפחות באמר, בריצות ארוכות, הם כמעט כולם מזרח אפריקאים, הם כמעט לא מזרח אפריקאים שמנצחים. זה יותר מסובך מזה. ההנחה היא שזה המון דברים שמשתנים ב-DNA שלהם, וקשה למדוד, אתה צריך לסיים את הסייז מאוד גבוה. זאת אומרת, יכול להיות שיש לך שני אנשים מאותו טרייב או משהו כזה, והשינוי הגנטי אצלם הוא לא בדיוק אותו דבר. אז אתה מקבל את הדאטה, הכל נראה ספארס והשינויים הגנטיים האלה, הסמפרס הזה הוא אופסי ואז אתה, יש, יש הרבה בעיות של איך להבין מה משתנה. יש גם שינויים שהם חוץ מהמזרח אפריקאי, יש כל מיני שבטים בכל העולם, יש להם יכולות אנדיורנס מטורפות, הם פשוט לא, לא, לא הולכים לאוליקדה, יש דוגמאות מפרו ומהימלאיה ו... חייבים להגיע גם אליהם בקרוב. אתם יכולים להמליץ למדינות האלה מי לטפל. כן, כן. הם יודעים, מה שהוא אמר זה ידוע. לא, לא, לא. של השבטים האלה יש אנדיורנס. כן. לא, לא, מה גנטי. בעזרת המחירים האלה אפשר לגנות את העמדים הנוספים שיש להם את הפוטנציאל. אני הצעתי להשתמש בישראל כקונטרול, אבל לא... זה לא הפוליטיקלי קורקט והם לא אהבו את זה. השאלה בגלל האם בגלל הגלובל וורמינג הסקנדינבים יתחילו לרוץ מרתון, שהאפריקאים יתחילו לעשות קרוס קאנטרסטייז. אבל יש לנו דוגמאות, נגיד של הבדות בת להימלאיה של השרפה, שיודעים שם איזושהי מוטציה. יש מוטציה אחת, היא לא מסבירה את כל השבט. בהקשר של גנטיקה, ממש יש שם, אחת ההשערות היא שזה מה שנקרא שינויים נדירים, אוקיי? זה פשוט יש באנשים אוסף של שינויים נדירים שמשפיעים על כמה סלולים ביחד ואנחנו פשוט לא יודעים אותם, כן? קשה לנו לדעת, קשה לנו לדעת אם שינוי נדיר הוא סתם בגלל שבמשפחה שלו יש סתם שינויים שלא קשורים להתעמלות בכלל או האם זה באמת שינוי נדיר שבאמת גרם לו להיות יותר טוב בספורט, וזה אולי הצ'אנג'ה הכי גדול. זה נראה שיש להם גם ברפואה רגילה, שיש מישהו עם משהו מאוד מוזר. כן, כן, common variance, נכון. כאילו פשוט יש איזשהו וריאנט ייחודי למשפחה, שאתה לא יודע אם הוא קשור. כן, המעבדה של יואן, שזה המנחה שלי, מתעסקת בזה ברפואה במחלות לב, במיוחד בילדים שהרפואה לא יודעת להסביר מה קורה להם. בילד, הלב לא נראה בסדר, לא יודעים מה המחלה, והרבה פעמים זה גנטי כזה. זה הקליניקה שהוא מריץ בסטנפון. אז אם זה באמת נדיר, אז הפתרון, אם היה לך סטנפון מספיק גדול, זה משהו כמו פוליג'ייט ריסורס, כאילו לאסוף הרבה סיגנל מהרבה... כן, אבל השאלה... כן, אבל זה מגיע ל... אתה צריך סנטרסייזר של איזה עשרות מיליונים, ואז כדי להגיע לעשרות מיליונים אתה צריך לקחת ממדינות שונות. אז יש הבדלים ביוגרפיים, כי יש פה, יכול להיות שיש לי מיטיישנס בכלל על כמה אתה יכול לדעות, אבל זה היה עוזר מאוד, בוא נגיד ככה. טוב, תודה רבה. יש כאן ראשון.